we go. Hello, everybody, and welcome to season two. Yes, season two of In House Con. I am Derek Mackey, your host, president of Cool Waters Productions, which is the uh, parent company of In House Con, and I welcome you and thank you so much for watching. I'm very excited this week because we've got some surprise guests that uh, we haven't told our other panelists about yet. So that's going to be really cool. But before we get to all the cool stuff, I always have to do my pre-show thank yous because I need to make sure that the people that help make this show come together are thanked. So this week I want to thank Trek Report, Alien V Predator Galaxy, Alien Theory, Star Wars Autograph News, and that's Frank D. Rich. Hi, Frank. Thank you so much. Be More Super, Be More Super Podcast, Nerd A Lot, Nerd, Alert, oh, for crying out loud, it's season two, and this is a good way to kick it off. I'm mumbling. Nerd Alert News, Comic Con Network, and of course, my uh, tech guy and co-producer, Tyler. Thank you so much, guys, for all of your support. So what is in-house con? Well, you know what? We're almost at a full year of the pandemic, COVID-19, right? And so Cool Waters and all of my amazing clients have basically lost all of the conventions all around the world in order to come to see you guys, the viewers, the fans face to face at conventions. So I decided last year to start this little virtual event and hopefully you guys are all enjoying it. So that's basically what in-house con is. It's a convention brought to you guys from the comfort of all of our homes. And I tried to go a little above and beyond and actually turn this into more of like a online television series as well. So it's not really just a convention. We try to make it a little more interesting, kind of like the Tonight Show or the Conan O'Brien Show where we have contests sometimes, surprise guests, advertise guests, delve into deep into, you know, our guests history and past and, and their film careers and television careers and try to make this really informative and exciting. So with that being said, we are listed on imdb.com. That is the internet movie, da movie database. That's where you can go online and find every film and TV show that has ever been made on the planet and see who is in it, directors, production notes, things like that. But what you can also do on IMDb is you can leave reviews and we would love it if you would go on to imdb.com and review our show. Good or bad, it doesn't matter to us, get on there and review it. Also, everybody asks us this, and I always forget to mention it from season one, but I'm gonna start mentioning it at the beginning of every show this season. We are available to rewatch, typically, typically two weeks after the original air date on our YouTube channel. So if you missed today's show, you're probably watching it right now on YouTube. So thank you so much. And we are, this year, we are going to start putting some other content on YouTube as well that kind of coincide with in-house con, some exclusive content. And we're also going to be listing our original TV series online called Cool Waters Live, which is, wow, it's almost 12 years ago now that we've done it. And we're gonna start re-airing some of those episodes for you guys to, to see. Anyway, enough about all that. Most of you who know us know everything about us and we thank you. Blast us out all over social media. Our handle is the same on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and, and uh, YouTube, at Cool Waters Prods. Please join us, like us, don't like us, thumbs up, thumbs down, whatever. As long as we're getting some attention, I would really appreciate it. So I think that's it for all the intro part. I guess you guys just want me to get to our first guest, right? So I've created a little video and I wanna show it to you now. I'm gonna do a screen share, so bear with me. Here we, oh, wait, wait, before we do that, I forgot to tell the viewers. How do you guys ask questions? The okay. Questions are asked in the Q&A area, not the chat area. The chat area is for all of you guys to chat amongst each other. If you wanna ask a panelist or myself a question, go to the lower right of your screen. There is a Q&A button. The Q&A button is where you can ask a question and I will read it on my screen out loud and the panelists will answer it live on the air for you, okay? We just ask that you keep it clean and family friendly, okay? Now that we've gotten that out of the way, let me play our little video and get our first guest on. So hang tight, I'm gonna do a screen share. I think I'm gonna do a screen share. Do, 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 do. Let's see, I need to get rid of that. Bear with me guys. I don't know what happened. Oh, there we go, screen share, thank you.
you guys don't mind, my, I'm Carrie Hen. For those of you who don't know me, Newton Aliens. And I decided to hijack Derek's show for a little bit. Um, I am so very excited about Dave Dorman being on the show today that I wanted to make sure I was here. And I wanted to be here to be part of this announcement that's coming up. So without further ado, I would like to go ahead and introduce the infamous Dave Dorman. Yay! Hi, Mr. Dorman. Hello. How are you? Hi, I'm fine. Thank you very, very much. This is a nice surprise. <laughs> we, we Derek and I were excited ago. to go ahead and to bring yeah. the surprise to you, and I'm excited too. Yeah. So. Uh, well, thank you. Yeah, we met years ago, and, and um, uh, it was really fun. And obviously, I've been a fan of, of the Aliens franchise for years, and uh, it's a real pleasure to be involved uh, in this and, and with you. So. I'm really thank you excited. To, thank you to Derek and, and thank you to you. Yeah, well, I'm really excited. Thank you so much. Um, and I haven't, well, before we say too much, do you want to go ahead and announce what the surprise is for today? Sure. So uh, um, Derek uh, and I uh, have uh, come to an agreement to do a number of, of very uh, limited uh, pieces of artwork uh, that will be signed by the uh, uh, actors that uh, I do the portraits of. And so the third one that we'll be doing coming up in the next couple of weeks will be Newt, uh, yeah. featuring the beautiful Carrie uh, as a youngster uh, <laughs> from the film. And uh, we have, I believe, a uh, um, uh, image of the, the uh, design. Oh, wow, uh, that's there. amazing. There we go. Wow. So, uh, uh, it's going to be real fun. I, I've enjoyed the movie, you know, for quite a while, and and uh, it's going to be fun to do a character that that I haven't done before, and so I'm pretty excited about it. Oh, I'm really excited. That is absolutely amazing. That's the first time I've seen it. Um, Thanks. Wow. I can. I am so excited about this, and I can't wait to get my own copy and like show it off to everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Good. I'm I'm happy to hear that. Hopefully, Thank it'll turn so out nice. We'll see when. Uh, when we get to that point. Oh, I'm sure it's going to be amazing. I've yeah. seen so much of your art throughout the years. It's Thank you. So. Thank you. Hi, guys. Hey, Dave, how did you like that surprise? <laughs> That was, uh, yeah, I wasn't expecting that at all. So thank you so much. It's, it's great to see Carrie again. Well, Carrie, thank you so much for taking time out of your day today to stop by. I know that you've got uh, some stuff to do with your family. So I will bid you adieu. And hopefully we'll see you in a couple weeks at Dave's of the Dead in Atlanta. Sounds good. I am really looking forward to it. And um, I will see you soon. And can't wait to see the final product, Dave. Take care. Thanks, Carrie. Take care. Bye. Bye. Very cool. Well, that was a little surprise that we put together for Mr. Dorman. And I hope, I hope he appreciates it. Carrie is amazing. And Dave, I can't thank you enough. I am so, as you guys can see, I've got my... My, uh, the first one that Dave did for us in the series, it's the Indiana Jones. Uh, whoops, let me take it out of the plastic so you guys can see it. It was on the screen. These are available now in, in the store. And, you know, Harrison Ford actually approved this artwork and approved the piece for Mr. Dorman and for Cool Waters to do. So this is, uh, with another way of saying it, endorsed by Harrison Ford himself. And, you know, he, both Dave and Harrison have signed it which is fantastic. And these are every piece that we're doing in the Dave Dorman collection are going to be hand numbered by Dave and they are, are limited to only 25 pieces around the world, that's it. So every piece that we announce, that is what they are going to be. And here we have a little graphic. I think we saw it really quickly in the video, but we've got a graph, where is my graphic? I don't have it, I'll get it in a minute. Um, you know what? But while we're waiting for that, Dave, I have another surprise for you before we before we kick off our interview. I've got my, another surprise. My, my heart can't take it. <laughs> so Tyler, let's bring in our next surprise guest. And while the two of them are chit-chatting for a moment, I'll find the graphic for the Dave Dorman collection. So let's bring him on. Maybe. There he is. Hi, Hi. there we are. Barclay. Hey, Dave Barclay. Great to meet you, Dave. Hello. <laughs> hey. Oh wow! And this That's... is the astonishing artwork that you did of Jabba, and I have to say, I think yeah. it's the very best piece of art of Jabba that I've ever seen. It's absolutely gorgeous. 
Oh, well, thank you. He's, he's a, a favorite character and, and certainly one that I like to, to paint because of all the texture that's, that's in his skin and lumpy and colorful and ugly. And <laughs> he's a pretty cool character and I'm glad you like him. Yeah, well, I mean, there, I think lots of people have tried and he is quite unique and you've absolutely yeah. caught him perfectly. Thank I mean, you. An absolute perfect capture of him it really you, you really feel that you're standing in front of him when you when you're looking at the painting it's brilliant so well thank, thank you, you very I was much so delighted to see it it was absolutely yeah. and i told derek the very first time i saw it holy crap <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. well you're making thank me blush you. i don't know if you can see but um, <laughs> uh yeah it's these are the type of paintings that i like to do you know the portrait mm -hmm. pieces even for someone as ugly as jabba the hut you know <laughs> it's a it's a, a nice portrait and, and uh it's my strong point and uh, i'm glad you liked it and i'm glad the fans like it as well that makes me feel very good yeah absolutely and yeah your your work is is just gorgeous and so so glad that you've been able to team up well, with derek i mean so it's a, yeah a great combination that's, that's been very nice and uh you know maybe you and i can work again in the future that would be, be fun yeah, yeah yeah we'll have to talk to derek about that yeah <laughs> i think so yeah well, hey, uh mr barkley i know as well i pulled you away from your family today and i know your wife was waiting for you so i don't want to keep you any longer all right Thank you so much for joining us, and, and I'm glad I got to introduce you to Mr. Dorman. So. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, again, thank you for the amazing work, Dave. Thank you. Uh, it's, it's been fabulous talking to you, and I'm very honored to have done that. Thank ah, you. Great. All right. Cheers, everyone. Cheers. Take care. Okay, bye, bye bye. All right. So that is a, another nice surprise for you, wow. Dave. I, I had to do something to thank you for the amazing work that you're doing. And the, uh, here's the uh, screen share that I was going to do so that everybody can see the Dave Dorman collection. So just so the fans know, there's the, the, uh, the upcoming one is the Newt one. Uh, Mr. Dorman is going to have that done in a few weeks. And we're already taking pre-orders for it on our website. I anticipate it to sell out. The, the Jabba the Hutt one and the Indiana Jones ones are still available. Jabba, there's literally like, I think, three left. So anyone that wants one should grab one now. Every piece, hand-signed and numbered, Beckett authenticated, comes with photos. Uh, let me show you guys. Uh, comes with a photo of Mr. Dorman and the celebrity signing the piece. That's the Jabba one right there with Mr. Barclay. And then uh, these, I'm not supposed to show this, so I won't leave it up <laughs> long because Harrison doesn't like it, but... Uh, there's Mr. Ford and Mr. Dorman signing it. And those pictures will come with your pieces. Uh, obviously, every piece is going to have a different price because it's all based on uh, the celebrity that's participating. Uh, they all come with Beckett authentications for both signatures, which is really fantastic. Again, limited edition, 25 pieces. And we've got, we've got a nice lineup coming with Newt being next. And it's going to be uh, exciting. I don't want to give any more hints away other than that. But anyway, Mr. Dorman. Hey, I, I was going to say, what are all those blank spots there? Someone's got to inform me of what's going on. <laughs> blank spots. We got to fill those up. That's right. We do. We do. <laughs> so I, have, I have no doubt that the uh, Star Wars and Aliens and maybe some other franchises out there, fans will, will be hammering over what you're going to have available. So uh, that, that sounds great. Yeah. I'm in for it. Yeah, and then I want to mention too, guys, some of the pieces, not all of them, some of them, Mr. Dorman is actually going to make the original artwork available for sale. Obviously, those are one of a kinds. And if someone is interested in getting those, they can contact Cool Waters and we will make sure that Mr. Dorman signs it and we will also get the celebrity to sign it as well. Again, it'll be very limited on which ones are available. And the key thing to remember with these art, pie with these art pieces is these they are exclusive to cool waters so mr dorman has graciously agreed these will never be duplicated in any form ever again except for his his book we've given him permission to use the images in his upcoming books right Not, right the, Dave, yeah there'll, there'll be no other uh, poster editions no postcards no use on comic book covers or anything like that this is exclusive to cool waters and if i do a book collection uh, again uh, I'd like to, you know, be able to put that in there too, but uh, you know, it's uh, it's it's a good thing. You're you're allowing me to do some really fun work, and and uh, uh, that's that's good. 
Well, I'm so happy that you agreed to it all. So, so Dave, I've got a few questions for you. And then obviously we always welcome any of our, our viewers who are watching live today. You know, obviously sure. if you're watching it on YouTube, you can't ask questions. But uh, if you want to ask Mr. Dorman a question, you can. But I've got some pre-written questions just to learn a little bit more about you, Dave. And okay. the first question is, is, how did you get into the into art in general? Was it from a very young age? Did you go to school for it? And what were some of your influences? Um, I got into art by really enjoying reading comics when I was young. And so my initial uh, um, sort of education in art was looking at the comic drawings and just copying them, trying to figure out how the artist, you know, drew them and the superheroes. And, and uh, I was, um, uh, you know, a child of the late 60s and early 70s. So I had Jack Kirby and and Stan Lee and, and John Buscema and, and uh, Steve Ditko and all these great artists from the, uh, uh, from the Silver Age to learn from. And uh, that excited me. And certainly I had an interest in science fiction and, and fantasy and comics. And that sort of drove my, um, my interest to following that subject matter. But uh, uh, as far as education goes, I, I really taught myself uh, I spent one year of, of school at the Joe Kubert School in, in New Jersey uh, for illustration. This was back in 1979, right when the um, uh, school opened. So I was, I was in actually the second year of the school. And um, they weren't teaching any painting at that point. Um, so it was all drawing and composition and, and learning, you know, how to, uh, how to tell a story even though I was interested in only telling a story in a single image, which brought me to painting. Um, and so I dropped out and I just taught myself and, you know, was influenced by artists around me and artists in the past and people like Frank Frazetta and Norman Rockwell and Dean Cornwell and, and uh, Boris Vallejo and, and just everyone was just an influence that, that I looked at. So I basically learned how to, paint the same way I learned how to draw, looking at other painters and figuring out how the paint works, how to lay it down and, and make it to look like what I want to. So that's really how it started was just, you know, teaching myself. That's incredible because your, your artwork is, I mean, and what we saw in the video is so spectacular and I can't imagine someone teaching themselves all of the technique and the shadowing and the three-dimensional I can't even explain it I that's well blown my mind. yeah I, I I had a passion for it I you know I I sort of set my my goals and I I worked hard to get there uh, I knew what I wanted to do I I wasn't uh, you know, sort of in school trying to figure out who I was and what kind of art I wanted to do I knew right from the start right you know when I was a teenager that I wanted to be an illustrator and so I, my path didn't diverge in, in different ways. I, I didn't go into modern art or, or graphics or anything. I just concentrated on the one thing that, that I wanted to do and, and just became good at it. What, what uh, format or what style of paints do you use? Is it oils or is it acrylics or is it pencil? Um, I originally started uh, teaching myself in oils, which everyone says is really hard and I shouldn't have done it, but I did. <laughs> and uh, and really, that's that's given me the the ground that I needed to be able to um, uh, move into other mediums. I painted in oils for about twenty years, and then I started to uh, work in other mediums into the same painting, uh, acrylics and color pencil and marker and and different types of things that would accentuate what I was doing in the oil. So it was, it was expanding my repertoire, sort of. Uh, but, but the primary uh, uh, medium that I do use is oils. Uh, the pieces that uh, I've done for you so far are oils. And uh, I'll continue to do that. There might be a little bit of color pencil or, or you know, acrylic on those. But I'd say in general, 90 to 95% of any artwork that I do is oil painting. And the rest is just sort of little bits and pieces here to sort of tie it all together. Um, well, it's breathtaking. I, I'm blown you. away. You know, I, I did 
get the original Indiana Jones from you and I have it hanging on our wall. We had it framed. I brought it to the framer and she was staring at it and, you know, trying to, and she saw the texture in it. And so the frame that we got has a little bit of texture as well. And right. she, she was like, are you going to be bringing more of these? And I said, well, you know, we'll see, but she was blown away. And <laughs> I, I, it's, your, your art's just amazing. What, Thank you. Thank you. Hey, what was your first paid gig when you were an artist that got paid for something you, you painted? Within the, the um, genre field or just? No, nope, just, um, just in general. Getting paid. Dave Dorman, the artist, get his first pay for art that he's done? Um, like, like a lot of young artists, I was um, probably 18 or 19. I was doing graphics for local uh, newspapers and, and uh, business cards and little things that weren't um, uh, genre oriented, but it was work. And so that was bringing some money in. Uh, it took a while to get established as a, a genre artist. And, and uh, it wasn't until 1982, uh, after about seriously, you know, three and a half to four years work, work, uh, you know, working on my art, on my painting. Uh, during that time, I was doing all the little things in, in, in the advertising uh, element. But um, in 1982, I, I sold my first painting to Heavy Metal Magazine. And wow. so that was really my first exposure into uh, science fiction fantasy. And then uh, after that, I sold the cover to Savage Sword of Conan to uh, Marvel Comics. And so that was my first sale to, to the comics industry. And after that, you know, I just kept going to shows and sending out my samples. This was before the internet day, so you had to put samples in the mail and send them out and wait a couple of weeks to hear from anybody. Um, but but I did that, you know, and it's the old way of doing it. And uh, uh, people, once they saw that I had some published work, uh, started to contact me. And so uh, I also had friends in the industry from the year that I was at the Cuba School and then people that I met at conventions. So I was getting my face, you know, shown around the industry and, and they'd see my, my sample work and such. But, uh, you know, in, at about 1984, uh, I guess I was, I was making a living uh, doing this, uh, various covers, uh, um, not necessarily painted covers, but I liked the Robotech. People don't know I did Robotech comics for Kamiko. And this was in the uh, uh, mid eighties. And, they don't realize it because it was all line drawing in an anime style. So it's completely different than, than what I, I am working on now uh, because it wasn't painting. It was, it was done specifically for a style of, of comic. And uh, people get excited when, when they hear, really, you did Robotech? Said, yeah, I did. I did about 25 covers for them. Um, so yeah, I've, I've fluctuated in and out of the comic industry. Uh, for a long time, I've done uh, movie production work, and, and I worked for Hasbro for a good number of years designing G.I. Joes, and uh, I've done a lot of Magic the Gathering uh, card art right, yeah. and uh, toy designs and all sorts of different things, um, and I think that's uh, um, uh, a bonus for my fans because a lot of them only know me from Star Wars or aliens or, or um, you know, Batman or, or you know, Predator or, or, you know, a big name uh, thing. And they don't realize all the little fun stuff that I've done, uh, right. you know, over the years. So I've, I've been very lucky to be involved in a lot of fun projects. And, uh, you know, being involved with you is certainly one of those fun projects that uh, I'm very much enjoying. Oh, thank you. You flatter me. You, you do. And, <laughs> and your, your answer, the end of your last answer actually leads me to my next question. And it's the one that, of course, a lot of fans are really going to, you know, want to hear the background for. I mean, you are synonymous with Lucasfilm and the Star Wars and Indiana Jones, you know, comics, as well as 20th Century Fox and Aliens. So how did you, right. you know, when did that break come? Wh which was first? Was it Indiana Jones, Aliens, or Star Wars? Which was first? Uh, it, it was Indiana Jones's first. Uh, I had been doing some work with some friends at Dark Horse Comics, and um, uh, 
uh, having been a, a film fan all my life, I was very familiar with uh, Star Wars from the 70s and, and uh, when Indiana Jones came out. And, uh, uh, you know, I was doing a lot of licensed work uh, uh, for small um, movies and, and uh, uh, TV projects. Uh, so, you know, my, um, my style had gotten to a point where um, it was being very uh, well accepted and, and uh, uh, easily recognized that I was able to capture the likenesses of the actors, which is what the movie companies want. Uh, they don't want someone that doesn't look like the actor if it's going to be Indiana Jones. So um, they were, um, uh, you know, asking for that. And so I heard through the grapevine that Dark Horse was getting the license. Uh, fortunately, I had a sample of Indiana Jones I had done, excuse me, a few years earlier. And so I gave that to them and, and they passed it along to uh, Lucasfilm and Lucasfilm approved me for the covers for Indiana Jones, uh, Fate of Atlantis. So that was my first introduction both to, um, uh, you know, working with Lucasfilm uh, and working with Dark Horse on a regular basis. Um, and then about uh, maybe nine months later, um, you know, they negotiated the license for uh, new Star Wars comics. And of course, you know, I'm, I'm going to throw my hat into the ring. And, and I did. Uh, and it's just a, a sort of fluke that um, uh, the artist who was doing the interiors, Cam Kennedy, uh, was originally going to do the covers. Uh, and somewhere along the line, uh, dealing with his editors, uh, he heard that I was interested in doing the covers. And uh, he stepped back and, and told them to hire me. Uh, to do it, which is sort of, you know, the right place at the right time type of thing. Right. Uh, I asked him about it, uh, uh, you know, later when, when I got to meet him, he lives in, in the UK. Uh, and I asked him, I said, I said, why did you do that? And he said, uh, Dave, you're a much better cover artist than I am. And I was just, wow. Because his work is just amazing. Uh, Cam's work was, was influential on me when I was, you know, young. And, uh, you know, here he is, you know, uh, really, you know, praising my work uh, unexpectedly. Right. And so, uh, you know, Lucasfilm have, having known that uh, I was doing good work for Indiana Jones, they said, fine. Uh, and then we did Dark Empire. And then that sort of, you know, snowballed into other Indiana Jones and other Star Wars and and uh, to be honest, you know, I'm very lucky that that happened. It, it made my career. Um, I've been doing still, after all these years, Indiana Jones and Star Wars artwork. And the fans still look forward to it. So I'm, I, I'm very lucky uh, in that respect. Absolutely. So here, let's look at our two pieces that you did for us. But to look at the detail, I'm going to bring up a screen share here. And I mean, just look, guys, I, I'm hoping everybody can see the, the amount of detail in Harrison's face here. I mean, you've captured him. You know, I mean, I've known the man for 15 years. I see him face to face. You've captured every element of him here. And I, I thank you. It is literally just blown away. And like I said, when I showed him the piece for approval, you know, he looked at it. You know, I've shown him stuff and sometimes he's just like, yeah, you know, eh, eh. but you know, he looked at it and he really he looked at it and it was like, wow. And yeah, you know, that's why I gave him a couple of the artist proof of this piece to give to charity because I felt that he was blown away with, with your art and your detail is, is incredible. So let's show also right. well, Java. Well, that, that, make, that makes me feel good because, um, you know, there have been some very popular and very good, much better artists than me uh, doing uh, portraits of, of Harrison Ford for publicity and for the films. Uh, Drew Struson obviously being the, the, the big one uh, yeah. that has done, you know, movie poster Star Wars Indiana Jones. And, um, you know, he, he was certainly an influence on, on my style, in particular uh, because I felt that, that his style uh, Drew's style was very indicative of what Indiana Jones was. Mm -hmm. And so I adapted the, you know, a little bit of techniques that, uh, that he used uh, and um, I just, you know, added them to my repertoire of, of techniques. And, um, 
you know, sometimes I get lucky and, and uh, it turns out right. <laughs> and, and so, <laughs> you know. You're I'm, very, you're very humble to say that because I, <laughs> I think the art's incredible, the detail, attention to detail. Look at all the texturing in this job of the hot one. I mean, you just, it's brilliant. It's. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I, I you know, when I started uh, a painting, um, you know, there are some artists that like to um, sort of paint in broad strokes. So it looks better when you step back and it, your eye sort of fills in all the spots. But, you know, because I paint fairly close to the canvas when I paint, I like to see the detail where if you get up close to it, you start seeing little things that you don't normally see if you're, you know, five feet or 10 feet away. And for me, that's exciting. And, and uh, you know, I've had uh, a fans comment uh, uh, very particularly about that, that they like to, to get in and look very close. And especially in, in the originals, because I do texture the board a little bit. So the original has a, a 3D effect to it. And uh, uh, it's real fun to see fans' reactions when they, they get to see that original. Absolutely. So Dave, let's take a couple of questions from some viewers, shall we? Sure. So our first question is from Janice. Hi, Janice. We love Janice. She, she watches our show all the time. She oh, nice. So Janice would like to know, Mr. Dorman, your artwork is brilliant. Do you have a favorite piece from your past work that stands out and why? Um, you know, as time goes by, favorite pieces change. Uh, just because I get to be a, a better artist with every painting that I do. So it's, it's really hard for me to make a specific choice. However, if I had to make a choice, um, uh, it would be the cover for Indiana Jones and the Fate of Atlantis. Um, my agreement with Lucasfilm uh, was that they have first option to buy the original artwork that I do specifically for Lucasfilm. Uh, and they have bought quite a lot of my artwork uh, over the past that's in the archives. And hopefully if they ever get the museum open, you might uh, be able to see some of those hanging on the wall. Yeah. Um, but uh, I never offered them the fate of Atlantis because I felt that um, uh, that particular painting really captured Harrison Ford, Indiana Jones, the, the the adventure of, of his character. And uh, I, I look at that painting now because it's hanging in our house. You know, I did that in, in the mid nineties, I guess. And I look at that painting now and I get real close. And um, um, sorry, I, I had a flash thing on, on my screen. Um, uh, I, I, you know, look at it from across the room and I, I walk up real close and I look at it and I just, wow, I did that like 30 years ago. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so if, if there's one that has to be named as a favorite, I would say that one definitely was. Wow, that is breathtakingly. I, uh, someday, Mr. Dorman, I might make it to your house and see that piece in person. <laughs> All right, let's take another question here. This is from Lisa, and Lisa says, would you, sorry, would you suggest young artists take the same re route you did to learn the craft? Um, I would suggest that the artists should rely on themselves much more than, than being taught. However, having someone be able to teach you will certainly quicken what you can learn time-wise because you're not going to struggle as hard to learn those things. But I have found with most um, uh, structured education, uh, especially in art, uh, the teacher will teach you what they know generally uh, and won't really uh, push you to go in directions that you want to go. And so I think that's where I found the freedom to follow my path and to, to be influenced by who I wanted to be influenced by. And certainly, you know, looking back, uh, the year that I spent at the Cuber School was very uh, uh, instrumental in, in educating me in, in a lot of basics. Uh, but, uh, um, 
you know, I think that someone who goes through, you know, a four year uh, college, um, to be honest, I think one or two years to get the basics and then just, just step out and find your path and do your own thing. Uh, that is my suggestion uh, because, you know, an artist needs to put themselves into their work and a teacher instructor, you know, will put themselves into your work. And so uh, it, it's always, uh, you know, I always get a, a, a strange look from, from teachers when I do uh, uh, lectures or, or demonstrations. Uh, you know, I say, uh, you know, teach yourself a lot of stuff because uh, the, the teacher, you know, they'll teach you what they know, but that may not necessarily be what you want to learn. And so I would say a combination of both uh, um, instruction uh, from outside and putting the time in yourself to do the work, to draw, to draw, you know, 10,000 drawings or, or, you know, paint, you know, 10,000 little pieces, uh, get the experience. Excellent answer. I hope you guys are learning a lot here. Okay, let's do another one, Mr. Dorman. Sure. Uh, this is from Jolson. And Jolson, by the way, he's all the way in Brazil. So we've got a Brazilian watching. Oh. Jol Jolson says, Mr. Dorman, beyond Star Wars, do you have a favorite or is Star Wars your passion? Um, being a film fan all of my life, I mean, literally all of my life, um, the involvement of doing film franchise artwork is very exciting for me because that, that sort of puts me into the film industry, uh, even though I'm not actually making films. Um, Star Wars, uh, I saw when I was 17 uh, in the theater and uh, I was the same age as Luke in the film. Uh, not necessarily Mark Hamill, but the character Luke. And, and I think that affected me a little bit with uh, uh, just, you know, the, the young boy wanting to get out into a bigger world. And that's the way I felt about my artwork as well. And so Star Wars has been with me most of my life. And, and certainly it's something that I've enjoyed, you know, over almost the 40 years of, of my career. Um, but it, it's not um, everything that I do. Um, like I, I said earlier, you know, my fans are, uh, get excited when they see a lot of the stuff that, that is not Star Wars related or is not, uh, you know, aliens related. And that's fun for me. And, and artistically, it keeps me on my toes because I'm not doing the same thing over and over again. Um, I'm, I'm doing different things. And, and, you know, even outside of the genre, I do lots of different things. I, I paint uh, 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 railroad locomotives. Oh. <laughs> okay. You know, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, pretty girls and, and uh, uh, landscapes. Uh, these are all things that, that, that I do because I, I love to paint, but also still, after all this time, um, is educational. Um, I've been a railroad fan all my life, you know, just as long as, as you know, I've, I've loved art. Um, but I decided to, to start painting, painting railroad work because of the textures that you find on rusted metal you know, bent up, dented uh, uh, locomotives and pipes and all sorts of stuff. And, you know, I learned a lot about texturing my, my paintings through doing some of that. And uh, some of that uh, uh, is, you know, I could point out things in the Indiana Jones and, and the Java that are right in back of you. I can point and show you, you know, directly where I, I have taken that, that particular technique from a railroad painting that I did, you know, 30 years ago. Okay, wait, that's a good challenge. Let me bring back up the Indiana Jones one on the screen and you show us. Hold on one second. Where is he? Ah. Give me a second, Dave. I got a doing screen shares. Okay, here's Indy. Here's Indy. And no, I got to get the right one. There it is. Okay, so I'm going to bring this up live so everybody can see it again. Doo -doo. There we go. Okay, go ahead, Dave. Okay, so if you can zoom into uh, um, 
sort of the background part to to the left of his head to the left okay yeah just just right there um i'm going to step over here to the corner of my studio and grab a painting okay uh, that i'm actually doing of a locomotive All and right. that way i can i can show you um uh, a little bit clearer rather than try to describe it. So okay give me a second this is awesome. See, this is one of those cool exclusives that we get to do, guys, that you can't do this at a convention. This would never happen at a convention where a guest can get up and go get something from their work area to show you. So with this yeah. is <laughs> exclusive for the show. Whoops. Okay, so, so you see this sort of parchment-y uh, texture that's, that's in back of him? Yes. Um, it's a style that I developed um, to um, add a, a texture, sort of a beaten, worn uh, texture into a lot of different things. Here, it looks like, you know, an old parchment, something that's, that's, that's worn and maybe burnt a little bit and, and uh, you know, has holes and is dirty. And, uh, um, you know, it's a really just cool texture to work with. Now, if we can go back to me, can you see me? I'm doing that right now. There you go. All right, let me see here. So this is, this is a, a locomotive painting I'm working on. And so we zoom in here and see this, this rust and, and dentedness and all of this going down here. That's oh, yeah. exactly the same technique. I'm just utilizing different colors and, and a, a different way of laying down the paint. But the basic um, technique is actually the same. It's exactly the same. Incredible. Wow. I can't wait um, to see that piece till it's done. Yeah. <laughs> wow. I'll, I'll send you a copy when I get it done. All right. But, uh, cool. you know, those are the things that, that you know, can be learned for, for something and then utilized into something else. And it's, it's just a matter of, of practicing, of, of learning how it works and how you can incorporate it in different ways. And so that's a, that's a texture that, that, I've sort of became known for um, because I can use it in, in fire. Uh, I can use it in um, uh, sand. Uh, it's a number of different things, but it's, it's a very simple, uh, simple way of doing it. But yeah, it's, those are, those are little things that, you know, I did a painting once and I, I, I thought, well, if I, if I do this with the paint, what will it look like? And, it came out looking good. And I said, well, if I do a little bit more, what will it look like? And then it looked, at, it looked like dented rust. And I said, there we go. I'm happy. And, uh, you know, so I've just been building on that uh, ever since. And like I say, utilizing it in different, uh, different ways on different paintings. Jabba's skin is exactly the same way. It's, it's um, uh, you, I don't know if you, I'm, I'm pointing at the, at the screen here. Uh, you could, you can see that his skin uh, basically is the same type of underpainting. It's got this sort of, it makes it sort of a mottled, moldy, you know, uh, lumpy skin. It's the same thing. That is, now when I, see now I have a whole other appreciation when I look at these pieces and so the fans, it's great. <laughs> All right, let's take another question here. Brett says, Mr. Dorman, in your book, The Art of Dave Dorman, there are pictures that you used live models. Is this normal? Is this a normal way that you make your artwork or was this a special circumstance? Uh, using models is, is a normal way uh, that I work and it's, a, it's usually a normal way that most painters work. Uh, most comic book artists don't, they draw right out of uh, their heads and uh, that makes for a bit more uh, dynamic imagery. Uh, in the comics, but with painting, most artists want to be a little bit more realistic. And so we do use models as reference. Um, I like to use models um, for almost everything that I can get because my desire is to paint very realistically. Um, with, um, uh, with particular pieces, especially with um, ones where I have to use the likeness of a character, say, Harrison Ford as Indiana Jones. Uh, I'll have a number of different photographs supplied to me from Lucasfilm or I've collected over the years of his face and, and his likeness. 
And then I'll have, um, you know, people come over and pose and we'll have a leather jacket and an open shirt and they'll have a whip and a gun and they'll pose for me. And then I'll do the drawing and then I'll have the face of Harrison Ford, the head and the, and the hat. And then I'll adapt that photograph to work with the photograph that I took of the body and, and the motion and such. Uh, so it's not like I have Harrison Ford come over and pose for me. But, you know, when you look at the finished painting, you might think that. And so, uh, yeah, that's uh, that's something that, that I, I do uh, fairly regularly for almost anything that you see me uh, have a model uh, or, or a, a, a human figure. Uh, for Jabba, obviously, you know, it's it's you know the shape you know the blobby the blobby look and the, and the big uh sausage fingers and <laughs> and uh, all of that so you know i don't really need a model for that you know i have for the photo references so i just draw it freehand you know based on on the photos and and uh, go from there but yeah uh there's nothing wrong with using photos a lot of art teachers uh say you shouldn't use photos there's nothing wrong with using a photo because a photo is just a replication of what you see in your in your eye all around you. Why not use a photo? You can't be in the forest every day. You're looking out your window at two feet of snow and you want to draw a forest. Um, you know, get a picture of a forest. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Our next question is from Angie. And Angie would like to know if well, she actually has two questions. So I'm going to combine them. Uh, first part of her question is, do you have anyone in your family that's artistic? And then her second question was, uh, who is your favorite artist? Okay, um, uh, family being artistic. Um, my mom used to really enjoy doing paint by numbers. You know, that's, that's a fond memory that I have from being very young. Uh, she wouldn't necessarily draw, but she really enjoyed doing paint by numbers. Uh, my dad, now that's a different story. Uh, he was in the military. He retired a lieutenant colonel. He was a, a lifer in the military. But his hobby and sort of passion was radio control airplanes. And, and there's a segment of radio control uh, that um, the modelers build exact scale one sixth reproductions of airplanes and my dad loved to build one six scale world war ii fighters and this is this is build building a model that is perfect to the actual physical airplane right down to the rivets that hold the metal together so you can see there's there's a level of detail and the level of patience that needs to be put into that, let alone, you know, make an airplane fly, know how to build an engine, know how to work all the levers and all the pulleys and all the things inside the plane to make it fly. And, um, uh, you know, so that's an art in itself, even though it's a hobby. Um, I learned a lot from him as far as, as having patience and taking things slow and doing it right. And, and just, you know, uh, uh, letting it develop. Um, so yeah, that was, that was my experience. You know, I didn't, I didn't realize it until, you know, after dad was gone, that, that he really influenced me a lot, not in the art, but in the way to approach it. Excellent. What, what was the other question? Uh, do you have a favorite artist yourself? Do I have favorite artists? I have a lot of favorite artists. Um, I enjoy looking at art. Um, and I've spent a lot of time um, investigating artists that I love. Uh, most of them are illustrators from the, the 1900s. Uh, I'd say um, Frank Frazetta is probably my, uh, my favorite uh, fantasy artist. Uh, he's the one actually that, that I started copying paintings from when I was younger, just like I started copying comic book drawings uh, uh, to learn how to draw. Uh, I'd say right now, 
Um, probably Drew Struessen is, is my, my current living favorite artist. Um, I really enjoy his work quite a bit and uh, uh, it's still an influence on me. I'd say, you know, of the illustrators from, from the 1900s, uh, Dean Cornwell and, and uh, uh, Norman Rockwell, uh, they're, they consistently influence me in my painting. Rockwell is fantastic. Okay, I've got something to show everybody. I put it together while you were, while you were talking. Let me do a screen share. So this is just a little bit about what you were talking about, Dave. You, at the bottom here in the middle, you've got an original production still from Return of the Jedi of Jabba. On the left, you have your hand-drawn sketch that you went back and forth with on me to say, hey, Derek, do you kind of like where I'm going with this? And then, also, and then on, on the right, you've got your final piece. So do you want to do a quick summary here of, of your breakdown or is it self yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, it's, it's not real hard when, you know, I'm working with a, an, an art director like you. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, I come up with with ideas that I like, and I think this one was the best. We had a, a second one that I don't think uh, worked as well because, as I believe it, it didn't focus on on specifically just Java, and so uh, uh, this one uh, really was was what was needed for the um, uh, signature uh, painting. And so, yeah, I, I did the whole thing, uh, you know, gave, gave him the bulk, you know, of his body and uh, the ugliness of, of his head. And um, to make it more interesting, you know, I gave him the hookah um, that uh, he has next to him uh, that adds a little bit uh, different texture, a little bit different uh, uh, look and, and something for the eye to look at just. Um, uh, uh, to look at so it doesn't get um, tired of just looking at the Java piece. And, uh, you know, added a little bit of, of shadow and, and highlight uh, coming in to add it some depth. And um, uh, yeah, it was, you know, it's, it's a fairly simple piece, but you get into it and, and you start looking at the detail and it looks a lot more complicated than it was. And that's a good segue to a question that we have from Alberto. He wants to know, how long does it take for you to finish a project? Every project has its own time frame. Um, I, it can take me, uh, just depending on the size, uh, I can do a, you know, a small six by eight painting in a day. Um, I can do something like the, the Jabba and the Indiana Jones uh, in, in three to four days. Uh, the job, I think, only took about two and a half days because it's, it's less complicated. I mean, you, you may look at it and say it's very complicated, but, you know, for me, uh, painting-wise, it's not. Uh, you know, up to uh, some of the paintings that I, I've done for the Star Wars Celebration, which were widescreen uh, prints that were uh, uh, giving you the, the um, ratio of seeing it in the theater, and those take about two weeks to paint. Uh, so... Every project is different, depends on, you know, how large it is, how, how complicated it is, you know, how many people I have to paint in it or, or you know, monsters or, or whatever. Um, but I, I'm good at judging that now, um, much better than I was, you know, 20 years ago. <laughs> uh, and that, that's, that's a major thing when you're a freelance illustrator, when, when you uh, rely on, on other people to uh, give you jobs, is you need to know how long it's going to take to do any particular job because you will have a deadline. And that is the be all and end all of any uh, freelance artist is if, if you don't hit the deadline, it doesn't matter how good the painting is, the deadline's the deadline. Yeah. So if, your, if you know- your deadline, if you, your deadline for Newt's very close. I know them. it is, I know. <laughs> well, I'll be starting that uh, Sunday or Monday. Okay. So yeah, it, you'll you'll see it. Yeah, this this one will go pretty quick because it's it you know once again it's not that complicated, right. uh, a piece. And uh, I I paint very fast for for an oil painter, uh, I paint incredibly fast, and that's that's something that that stuns a lot of people, especially uh, teachers and and people who have been doing it for a long time. Uh, just 
it's one of those things that I taught myself when I was younger teaching, you know, not having someone say, you can't do that. They look over my shoulder and say, well, you can't do that. That's not the way it's supposed to go. And I say, well, here it is, you know, I'm doing it. And uh, so I, I've learned, you know, uh, uh, things to, to make it speed along. So uh, when people think oils, they think, wow, you know, it's going to take a long time because you have to wait for it to dry, blah, blah, blah. I can put on four layers of oil paint in a day and have them all dry and start again, you know, within hours. So that's, that's really the key. Um, that's, that's the key to my success is being, being able to turn over pieces pretty quick and still have the quality uh, that I need and that my client wants. Absolutely. We have a lovely comment. I believe it's from your, your wife, Denise. She says, uh, <laughs> Dave's and my son Jack is showing some definite artistic talent. So that goes back to Angie's question about talent in your family. I guess your son is going to be a drawer. Uh, uh, Jack has some interest in, in visual stuff when he was younger. Uh, he had a very vivid imagination and some of the things he would write for school were very uh, fun and weird and imaginative. And, and uh, he did some drawing and, and I helped him. But, you, you know, as, as kids get older, they're, interests sort of wander a little bit and uh he just this past year he's gotten back to doing some drawing and some real interesting visual things and so you know i encourage him uh, i want him to uh, uh be happy in, in what he does and i i try to stay you know away uh, because i don't want you know to be hanging over his shoulder like teachers are you know when they're in school right so yeah we'll see where that goes um, it would be great, excuse me, it would be great if, um, if he did, you know, follow in my footsteps. But, you know, that I, I have some big feet, even though his feet are bigger than me. Uh, <laughs> I have some big shoes to fill and, and I, don't, I don't want him to ever feel the pressure that he has to, uh, has to fill my shoes. Understood, understood. Brett wants to know if you can show us what's on the drawing board behind you. Oh, sure. Uh, this is the actual uh, pencil uh, drawing uh, for the Newt piece. Oh, let me get oh, wow. it back a little bit. Very cool. So this is what I draw first, and then I transfer this drawing onto the board that I paint on, which in this case is is a canvas uh, board that uh, I bought at Dick Glick but I'll be making a special uh, texture board uh, to do the newt on. But yeah, this is what I do. I make a drawing first. And uh, then once I'm happy with all the elements, then I transfer it to the board that I paint on. And then I start painting. Uh, I, I felt that um, early on in my career, if I didn't have a good drawing, I was sort of lose track of where the painting was going. And then it just wouldn't turn out. So I made a point in my career to make sure that the drawing is right first, and that way it eliminates problems afterwards. So yeah, that's what's uh, that's what's on my drawing board right now. So you know, there there you should feel confident that it's going to happen here very very soon. <laughs> I do. I total faith in you. Total faith in you. All right. So we're getting close to Mr. Dorman's time frame here. I'm going to ask just two more questions, uh, David. I'm going to let you go. So. Okay. First one is from Dan, and Dan says, what figure or character, hero or villain, that you haven't done before, but is on your bucket list to, to paint? Oh, geez. Um, that's a hard one because I've been involved in so many uh, franchises that I've, I've loved so much, and, and uh, wow. I don't know, you know, you, you go back and you think, you know, it'd be great to do Godzilla. I did Godzilla. You know, I, I've done King Kong. Um, <laughs> you know, I've done almost every character in the Star Wars universe. Uh, Indiana Jones, Aliens, Predator, you know, Batman, uh, Superman. Uh, I've, I've, done, I've done them all. Um, you know, it, it's... It's really now about the challenge of taking something that's been done before, either by myself or another artist, and making it unique. And so 
it's not necessarily that I want to do, you know, something that I haven't done because that's going to be a hard thing to manage. Uh, but it's, it's taking something that's been done before and making it new and interesting for the viewers. Gotcha. Good, good, good. All right. I'm going to do a Dave Zentz. I know you've got a question there and I'm going to use it as a transition. Okay, Dave Zentz. So just hold on. Kyle Russell will be our last question for Mr. Dorman. Kyle Russell would like, to, uh, has said, uh, Mr. Dorman, your art is so beautiful and is blowing my mind. When you finish a piece, do you have a specific place in your house to keep it like a mini museum? Um, no, it sits in a drawer. I'd, I'd like to say there's some, some fabulous place that, uh, uh, you know, they're hanging on her. But uh, no, I have, I have some flat files that I, I put the art in or, you know, um, it, it'd be nice to have a really big house with a really big studio to, to hang some of the stuff. But I, I you know, I'm, I'm putting out maybe two, three, four paintings a month. And, uh, you know, I don't have space for all of them. Uh, most of them are being published. So uh, I don't necessarily feel the need to display them because they'll eventually get displayed on a book or a comic or a magazine, which will be generally available. Uh, the house uh, has a, a small number of paintings that, that I like quite a bit and my wife likes. And, and so we've hung those, but you know, we have other, other artists in the house as well. Um, yeah, it, it'd be great, you know, to have, have them hung, but it, it's just not feasible. Uh, the, the number of them uh, just uh, doesn't work out. Um, what, I'm, what I'm doing, uh, what I'm trying to do uh, with some of these uh, train pieces, and I'll plug that again, of course. <laughs> is be able to uh, have enough to do a show so I can get a gallery interested in uh, uh, having a display so that people can actually come out and see the originals. Uh, in a gallery situation. I'm, um, I, I've been asked by a number of people um, that attend the San Diego convention if there was a way that I could get um, San Diego to do a gallery or something uh, for, uh, uh, for my art. And, and, uh, or if I could just do something uh, uh, during that time at one of the hotels, uh, have like a private showing and, uh, or something like that. And, and that's something that I might do. Uh, because I would like to, you know, have people look at the art. It's the art is so different than uh, than the painting than than the print, right. uh, because the art is three dimensional. You have you have texture that I put on. You have the thickness of the paint. You have the texture of the canvas. Uh, you have the transparency of, of the paint. Uh, it's really a three D experience, even though you don't think of it that way. Uh, so the art does take on, a, on a, a little bit more life of its own when you see it in the original. And if you're going to talk to Dave Zantz, uh, he owns a couple of my paintings. So he can tell you that the art uh, in its original is, is much more uh, dynamic. Absolutely. Well, we're going to answer his question, but I'm going to combine it into a, into a bringing on our next guest and to exit you. And okay. you know what, Dave, I love the idea of doing something with you. I might have some people that we could talk to about maybe putting something together for San Diego at a hotel or something. Um, you and I should okay. talk about that. But what I'd like to do now, before I let you go officially, because we've got uh, something I want to pitch to you live, is I want to bring on our next guest. It's Brett Parker. He is one of the promoters of Granite State Comic Con out in New Hampshire on the East Coast. He's an amazing man. He also does what I do. He represents some actors and, and he's going to be my next guest on the show. We're going to talk, but his, he, the reason I wanted to bring him on is because it kind of coincides with David Zenz's question. Hi, Brett. How are you? Hello, Derek. Hello, Mr. Dorman. Hello. Good to see you. Good to so, see you. So David Zenz asked us, do you think we might see shows this year or do you think it might be 2022? So Brett and I are going to talk a little bit about that today, but here's the, here's the thing. I've talked to Dave in the past since we started working with him about the potential of maybe he joins Cool Waters on the road at a couple of shows with the clients that he's done paintings for. And the reason I wanted to bring Brett on before Mr. D Dorman left is because Brett has something to ask you, Mr. Dorman. <laughs> okay. Um, 
should uh, you and Derek do work out uh, some type of uh, way that you guys can hit the road together and uh, do cons? Uh, uh, I, I would love it if, uh, you know, you, you gave New Hampshire uh, <laughs> uh, some thought process. Uh, we would love to have you at the Granite State Comic Con. I would love to make that uh, uh, official. <laughs> verbally okay, well, official. I, I appreciate I appreciate that and uh, you know I'll have to talk to Derek and see what what he has scheduled out but I have a lot of fans in the Northeast that um, continually ask me you know before yeah. before the, the COVID uh, you know when I'm going to be coming back into the Northeast I, I haven't been there in eight years maybe maybe longer you're, you're about so, to and so, uh, yeah, it would be great to get back up in the area and, and see all the fans again. And, yeah, let's see what we can do. Awesome. Wonder okay. That. Thank you so, so much. But, yeah, my pleasure. But, you know, we still have to figure out what's happening with the COVID thing. The, the major conventions, they're still all up in the air. Yeah. Um, the, the big one here in Chicago, the uh, C2E2, they just announced for December uh, uh, this year. And... Um, you know, I, I, it, it's just really hard to tell that far down the road what's going to happen. Yeah. Um, uh, so, yeah, I'm keeping my ears open, and it would be great to get out and meet the fans again, and um, we'll see. All right. Well, Mr. Dorman, I thank you so much for taking – more time than I pro said you would be on for. So thank you for answering the fans' questions. Thank you for being my guest today. Thank oh, you. It's my pleasure. Amazing artwork and working with me. And I can't wait to see you again in person. So thank you, sir. At, at some time, we will get together in person again. All right. Thank you for, ha thank you for having me. Take care, everybody. Bye. Cheers, Dave. Bye-bye. Oh, so, ladies and gentlemen, just before we uh, pop on here again with Brett, just wanted to pop up our graphic again for the Dave Dorman collection. This is an exclusive set that we are doing with Mr. Dorman. Uh, all of those spots that you see with question marks are going to be filled. They are going to be filled with Star Wars, Aliens, and some, a couple of other franchises. That's the only hints I can give you. Every single piece is going to be the exact same format of Gicle. They're numbered strictly to 25 pieces only and that's globally around the world. So uh, what we, oh, and one thing we're gonna do, I talked to Dave about this, he said it was a good idea. Anyone who buys one of our pieces, if you want the next piece to match the handwritten number of the 25 units, you can request that when you check out. So if you want all number 18, 18, 18, 18, you can request it. Now we can't guarantee you'll get it, you know, obviously first come first serve, but my staff and I are going to make every effort to make sure that if a fan is trying to build a collection from our Dave Dorman collection, that we give you the matching numbers. So there you go. So uh, Brett Parker, welcome officially now to your segment of the show. Thank you for joining me today. How am I supposed to follow Dave Dorman? But no, thank you so much, Derek. Thank you so much for having me. This is, this is fantastic. I was, uh, I was thoroughly enjoying uh, just listening to that. I have two takeaways before we begin. Uh, yeah you bring up like the production still of Jabba and then you bring up his artwork and like his artwork is better than the production still. Like it, it, it's like, how does he even, how do you do that? Um, the other one is gallery owners should be like doing a Royal rumble as to see like who gets to show him because like uh, uh, he would just destroy at a gallery show. It's unbelievable. Absolutely. Well, you know, I know a gallery up in Canada who does a lot of Billy D. Williams's artwork, and I think with your comment there, I might get a phone call to him. So, look at that. It's yeah. I. That is a better Jabba than the actual picture of Jabba. Yeah. So no, cool. His, his artwork's amazing. So, anyway, let's continue on to David Zentz, Zentz yes. question. Um, so just so so you guys know again. Brett Parker, my, my second guest today, not only is he a promoter of the Granite State Comic Con out in New Hampshire, but he's also a representative uh, like I am and, and has some talent that he brings all around the world to meet fans face to face. So he kind of knows both sides of the world, which is why I wanted to have him as a guest today. So Dave, I'm going to start off with what I know about shows and then Brett is going to chime in with whatever he knows because really, Dave, this is the thing. From This is my point of view. Brett might have a different point of view. I'm actually at a complete loss because 
when January 1st hit, there wasn't a light switch that went on and went, okay, COVID's done. We're going back to normal. Okay. I personally, the last show that me and my company did was in March of last year and it was in Mexico. And we heard about the pandemic officially being called a pandemic and starting while we were in Mexico. And we did the convention in Mexico when we were supposed to stay and visit family for two weeks. My travel agent called us while we were in Mexico and said, you need to come home now. So we ended up having to cut our trip short. We, we got to finish the convention. And, and at that convention, that was when they first started doing no touching. And our guest was Doug Jones. And if anyone who knows Doug Jones, he loves to hug anything that moves. And telling him not to hug people or even shake yeah. people's hands was a nightmare. But so that was our last show. We have not had any shows up until we did a very small show in Vegas in October. And we do have a show. My company is going to a show with Carrie Henn, who was a surprise guest today, to Days of the Dead in Atlanta. But again, these are super small, small shows. They're like 1,500, 2,000 guests. That's it. You know, it's not a, a major Comic Con. So I don't know if we're going to go back to normal Comic Cons in 2021. I've already lost some shows. Brett, I'm sure you did too. Read Pop, uh, who runs Emerald City, C2E2, like he just mentioned, Star Wars Celebration. All of them got pushed to 2022. All the big ones are, are done. They're not going to be going this year because you can't put 50,000 to 100,000 people in a room safely. You just can't. So I know that the big ones are gone. Not gone, postponed. Let me rephrase that. Sorry, they're postponed till 2022. Now, some of the smaller shows... Like I said, Days of the Dead is one that is coming up. And now I will transition over to Brett's answer because as of right now, we are still planning to go to Granite State Comic Con in September. So Brett, with everything that I've just said, let's have your in input on it all for Dave's ends. Um, so, okay, so your last show was March. Mine was at the very end of February. It was in uh, Las Vegas. And you know, the talk, it was starting to get really scary. It was just like, should we even be here? Like this was, you know, the start dropping the pandemic word, but they didn't, weren't making it official. Um, so yeah, so it's, I mean, so it's a year and your perfect analogy of the light switch didn't go on as soon as 2021 hit. All right, January, all the shows start booking in February and March. And so it's, any ones uh, last year that said, okay, we'll be in January, we'll be in February, they've now moved. And then, you know, all of the existing ones, they have like, basically all the shows are like backloading 2021 or just saying, you know what, we're just gonna, we're just gonna, we're just gonna call it and, and just shoot for 2022. Um, so uh, New Hampshire, my, my con, uh, it is not, you know, it, it, it is it is a phenomenal con. Don't get me wrong. It is. We love your Derek. Get back, <laughs> Derek. Please say something. Yes, um, we love your show. <laughs> but it it's not. We don't get you know fifty thousand attendees. Um, so should the planets align and we're good to go? Uh, I mean, as of right now, we're acting like we're good to go uh, for September. Um, we will you know put all of the utmost parameters in place. Uh, for the safety of our guests, for the safety of our, our attendees, for everything like that. Um, so, you know, we're basically we're, we're planning for, you know, planning like it's business as usual, but obviously we're, we're able to shift at a moment's notice uh, should the need hit. But as of right now, there's a lot of cons that are going to be at the tail end of 2021. It's going to be like multiple major shows a weekend. Um, so that's, that's going yeah, to be that's, interesting to navigate. That's what we're running into right now is a couple of shows that were postponed from last year or earlier for this year are now pushed to later in 2021. And I've got some weekends that have two or three shows, which means we're going to be spread thin or we're actually not going to be able to do some shows because they're also duplicate guests. So, yeah. you know, I know I had on my show last year in season one, Dave Hainan from Fanboy Expo. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and Dave just informed me that there may be some changes to his schedule this year. He's got four events this year. He's got Knoxville, Columbus, Indianapolis, and another one. And he was just giving me the heads up that, you know, we might be making a change. And I'm like, oh, 
no, 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 please. I can't, you know, cause I, I need to support my family. I need to have put food on my table and it kills me, you know, that, that we're having to do it. I understand why we're doing it. Don't get me wrong. Mm -hmm. watching. Right. Right. We have to be safe. We have to protect each other, but it, it's a struggle. It is. Um, but you know, Hey, vaccines are rolling out. You know, the needle's moving in that regard. No nope, needle, no pun intended. Um, you know, <laughs> things are, so I'm just, I'm, you got to stay positive. Like throughout all this, I'm staying positive. I know you're staying positive. Um, you know, all my, my cohorts at the Granite State Comic Con, you know, are, we're all just business as usual, as best as we can. Good, good, good. So good. That's a good segue, Brett. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your event, how you got started, sure. give a little bit of a history about it. This is your time to promote Granite State Comic Con. Awesome. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, so 18 years ago, um, me and my, some of my absolute very best friends, uh, the two brothers, Chris and Scott Prue, uh, we decided to open up a comic book store because there was a, uh, there was a little bit of a black hole in our local area uh, as far as comic shops went. Life, lifelong collectors, you know, just the whole nine yards. So we decided to open up a shop. And uh, we really hit the ground running with it. It was, you know, knock on, I'm knocking on wood right now. Things, things were great to start. We, we know we filled that void and, you know, everyone came out to support us. The following year, uh, so 17 years ago, we decided to do a Comic-Con. There was a, a venue that was literally, I don't know, maybe five minutes down the road from, from our store. Um, so we set up a Comic-Con. And this was a comic con in every sense of the word. It was just comics, ven you know, comic vendors, uh, toy vendors, things like that. There was no, there was no, oh my God, no celebrities. Cause we're like celebrities. We can't, what? We're Manchester, New Hampshire. We're not bringing in celebrities. That costs like a hundred thousand dollars to get a celebrity. We're not doing that. So we ended up having a very successful first year, 17 years ago. Um, so we were able to the following year, like double in size. And by double in size, I mean, the one room we used, they took the air wall down and now we're able to use that. So for the next 10 years, we were serving our area as just a straight up Comic-Con. Um, we would grow inside. All right, now we use these two rooms. Now we use this room over here plus these two rooms. Now we move to this section. But there was another section, the expo hall. And that was kind of like our holy grail because that's the big section. We're like someday, someday we're gonna do that. All throughout our first 10 years, people are like, hey, could you maybe bring in a wrestler? Could you maybe bring in a voice actor? Could you, any celebrities? And this was so scary to us because we're like, oh my God, how do we bring in a celebrity? Like this, this is just crazy. Um, so, so, okay, so I have my two business partners, Chris and Scott. Then we have our first part-time employee that we ever hired, uh, Pat Covey. And Pat, uh, this kills me to give him so much credit, but he, he had the vision <laughs> of the Comic-Con. Like, he's like, no, 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 it's got to be two days and it's got to be celebrities and it's got to be, we got to do it. I'm like, where does this money come from? You know, like we're kind of like, ah, we're breaking even. This is great. We can just keep doing this little, little events. But as we grew, we started crunching some numbers and it became like, we could probably do this. So we ended up hearing this like urban legend about uh, somebody that, that is able to book celebrities. And the guy's in like Massachusetts. And I'm like, that's impossible. That's, that doesn't happen, but okay. So we get in touch with uh, celebrity talent booking, uh, Jeff Zanini, and uh, I'm not even talking to the guy. Like, my business partners are talking because I'm doing, I'm doing other things for the con. I'm almost like, I'm like, I don't know. I think this could be a mistake. This could kill us. You know, we lose all our money with these celebrities. Like, I don't know. I don't know how to handle that. So we end up working out a deal to bring in five voice actors. And they're like the I'm hearing these names and I'm like, how is this even possible? It's like Jim Cummings, who's like Winnie the Pooh and Tigger, <laughs> you know? I'm like, okay. Um, Rob Paulson, Jess Harnell, Richard Horvitz, 
Quentin Flynn. Like we're bringing in like the guns. And that's when I learned this magical thing called a guarantee, <laughs> you know, where it's like, <laughs> oh, wait a minute. We might not be, we might be out the money, but we might not be out the money. And we ended up for the 10th year as like our, our celebration, we did a two day con, we brought in celebrities. And that was like, we kind of were like, okay, this is, this is now a comic con in every sense of the word. Um, and the owner of this company, Jeff Zanini, he and I ended up like completely hitting it off, um, bonding over our love of Disney World, which you and I have done that too, by the way. Yes, <laughs> Disney, Disney World brings everyone together. <laughs> and I started traveling with him, helping him out at shows. And it was just kind of like, a, hey, are you free this weekend kind of thing? And that was... I got that was eight eight years ago. <laughs> so it's just been, you know, and now we're we're booking together and everything is it's you know it's just this whole new world. Whereas back then I was terrified of bringing in a celebrity because I didn't know. To now I'm able to talk through that promoter. That's like oh we can't have celebrity. Oh no no we can't afford any celebrity. You know, we talk it through and um. But year two. Year two, I call it year two, but you, you're 11. So our second year of being a two day, uh, Derek, you really kicked the doors open uh, because we had uh, Billy D. Williams. D. Williams, yeah. And it, you know, it's the best problem ever to have is when the fire marshal is like, it's a lot of people here. <laughs> you know, the fire marshal was set up by Billy D's line, <laughs> which was a snake for all day. It was like, so that was good. We're like, oh my God, the fire marshal is finally taking notice of us, you know? Yeah. I but, remember that. I, and yeah. I'm, hum I'm humbled that we were part of your second 11th year and that we were able to bring someone yep. Billy's magnitude to your event because obviously his name leads to you know people coming through the door and and i can tell you on a personal level that it was one of the events that i fell in love with which is why now every i mean you've had me back with some guests i think almost every year since you might have missed every year five, since yeah yes but, you know because i know and i get it and this is why i always want to go back because your show like fanboy expo because people hear me talk about fanboy expo all the time your show and, and that show they're like my favorite shows to go to the big ones are great you know i mean they are but i don't like being surrounded by so many people and it you know brett you know i mean it's stress when you've got a line a mile long and people complaining the mm -hmm. mom and pop shows the smaller shows where you can really engage with the fans and and you guys have great programming you know you try to think of everybody that's there that you think of your military you think of your family and the kids you know, you have a good lineup of different people. You and Chris, Chris, hi, if you're watching, I, I love him. You guys have really nailed it. And, and you're the type of show that I, I wish I could do like every day or because they're in Eric. No, no, they really are. And I'm not just Thank blowing you. smoke up your ass. I'm, <laughs> people that know me know that that's, those are the shows, because I talk about it all the time. They're the shows that I like. They're, they're just more intimate. And to me, that's the experience that fans want. I mean, fans will stand in line at New York Comic Con to get someone's autograph for five hours, but mm -hmm. are they enjoying it? No, they're enjoying that 30 seconds when they're up at the celebrity and they've waited all that time and they're like, please autograph and, uh, you know, and then it's over. But yeah. at, at smaller yeah. shows, there's still lines, but they're, you know, you get to interact with your fellow fans a little bit more and you get, I get to talk to the fans a little bit more and get to know them. And so, I hope your show's around for a very long time. I really do. Thank you so much. Uh, that means so much to me. Thank you. Absolutely. And it will be. I promise you. It will be. Good, good, good. So pending that nothing happens this year, that we do get to come and see you in September, this is kind of like a cross promotion. We're going to promote your show and my people. We've got a good lineup of my clients coming to your show. Do you want to rattle off? Yeah, well, and, and it was it – was, supposed to be we're just basically copy and pasting because we had to obviously you know cancel 2020 um and our show was always september um and as of right I, this is so embarrassing i need to double check and make sure what our weekend is or maybe is it on we, your site it it's changed a couple of times gone back and forth um but i Let's think look. it's the 
Yeah, you can find out live. Look at that. Granite State Comic Con. GraniteCon.com. G-R-A-N-I-T-E-C-O-N.com. GraniteCon.com is Granite State Comic Con. Right now, it says on your site, yep. September 18th and 19th. Yes. Yep. Yep. Okay. And the wonderful guests that are coming... Oh, you guys haven't reposted them yet from last year because you were waiting. But I can tell you this, if it's okay with you. Eric, right, take it away. Yes, no, sorry. I'm and serious. Please all, take it away. They're all locked in. So I can tell you they're all willing to come as long as, as COVID doesn't stop anything, obviously. So, but uh, let me bring up my list so that I don't make a mistake because that would be embarrassing. <laughs> Uh, let's see. I have to go over here and find it. Bear with me, guys. This is the great thing about live live shows. So we We're have just, yeah. we have from Star Wars, the Star Wars franchise, uh, a headliner for us, Mr. Julian Glover, who played General Veers. This gentleman Ooh. is a classically British trained actor. He's been in six franchises: Star Wars, Indiana Jones, Harry Potter, James Bond, Doctor Who, and. Uh, what's the other one? I can't remember. Anyway, six major franchises. The man is brilliant. He's such a nice gentleman. So he'll be there along with Ray Hassett from Empire Strikes Back, Mark Capri from Empire Strikes Back. And I believe if nothing changes, John Ratzenberger should be coming as well. And everybody, of course, knows John from Empire Strikes Back, Superman, uh, and then every Disney Pixar movie that has ever been Every made, Pixar movie. Yeah. Either a, a, either a supporting character, a main character, or just a cameo. He's in every Pixar movie. He likes to play games with people. Uh, when they come up to his table, if there's a new movie coming out, he'll play games with them to say, well, you've got to find out who I am. And, you know, I don't know, he makes up games on the spot. It's, it's great. And John, the good thing about John, too, he will do voices for the kids if they ask him to. So it's so really cool. cool. And you, their oh, eyes light up and it's like, yeah. So that's, that's the lineup from Cool Waters. Of course, we'll let Granite State announce any other guests that they have coming. And who knows, Brett, maybe Mr. Dorman will join us and maybe we get Mr. Dorman to do part of our collection as uh, an exclusive of maybe Julian Glover as general uh, leaders, And we add that to our collection. So who knows? So cool. Yeah. So many uh, things we can do. We're wide open for it, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. So cool. All right. Well, Brett, thank you for that. And now, so talk, talk just a little bit about the other side of what you do. I know you mentioned Jeff Zanini and, and traveling the world with him. And this is again, what I do, you know, what's, and you don't have to give too much because people will get bored with it because what yeah. we do is boring, but you know, what's your favorite part of it maybe? And what's your favorite show aside from yours that you like to book your guests into and tell us who some of the well-known people that you work sure. with so people know. Sure, sure. Um, so, all right, to, to break it down, um, it's always uh, rough traveling because you're away from your family. Um, but the cool thing is you kind of establish this like road family. Um, and, you know, I remember uh, early on into my travel, I actually uh, met you. I think the first time I met you, Derek, was at a show in Canada. Um, was it Canada, really? It was. It was, um, and I can't think of where it was. It wasn't Saskatoon. Could anyway, it, it, it does. But <laughs> you and I ended up actually hitting it off right away. Um, so what do I like about it? I love, I love just being on the road, experiencing new things. Um, um, you know, uh, obviously a, a, a fan of food. I love, you know trying new stuff like that you and i you and i remember, have had some remember where meals. were we with that that pork uh was it texas oh, or boston was, the pork it chop in, it was in texas and you went back the next day yeah it was so good i've never had a pork chop like that in my life unbelievable anyway i didn't mean to cut you off oh no 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 <laughs> that's totally fine um so yeah so you just you have this experience of you know, you're on the road, you're seeing all these different things. But then when you report to work at these shows, you get to see these amazing interactions, you know, between these fans, you say waiting in these lines, you know, their fans get to meet either their childhood or their idol or their idol who was their childhood. 
um, you know, like I, like I mentioned, you know, we first brought in, you know, Jim Cummings, you know, I can't even count the number of, of places that I've, I've been with Jim. And it's just, it's just a surreal, amazing, you know, a surreal and amazing experience. Um, so being away from your family is definitely the downside, but this, you know, what you establish on the road as your road family kind of does temporarily, you know, Absolutely. fill in. Absolutely. Yeah. And name some of your bigger clients, Jim Cummings being obviously sure. a major one, Winnie the Pooh. I mean, obviously when you introduced him to my mom and I, we cried because it oh. was the voice for us. And it was like, oh, I can't believe it's Winnie the it, Pooh. It, it really, it, it literally still gets me. It will always get me, you know, and I'll just see people burst into tears you know, um, so we have uh, Tom Kenny, who's the voice of SpongeBob SquarePants. Um, and whenever I do anything with him, I'm good to cry. Like, I don't know, maybe five or six times that weekend, because he's actually be the way autistic kids gravitate to him and how he acts with them. It's, it's just like a thing of magic. It's like, it's these moments that I've just been, you know, so lucky to be to be privy to of how he is with his fans. Um, uh, I will uh, never, you know, never not want to be part of that. Um, so uh, Kari Payton, uh, King Ezekiel from The Walking Dead. Um, and he's also Cyborg from Teen Titans. Um, so we have him. Um, if you go to, you know, www.celebritytalentbooking.com, we have a whole, you know, rundown of our client list. Um, but you know, it's just, it's just kind of just being part, you know, just being tangent to these phenomenal things that are going on. It's just, and I'm sure you've seen countless. Yeah, no, well, I've, I've seen countless of, but I've participated and I just count my, my blessings every day because, you know, Star Wars and Superman were one of the first movies that I ever saw at the drive-in theater. And to this day, if anyone had ever told me, you know, you were going to be friends with Billy Dee Williams and Harrison Ford you know, Lando Calrissian and Han Solo, I would have, been, yeah, right, you know, so I count my blessings every day that I'm quite lucky to have, have those people in my life. I'm lucky to have people like you in my life and, and making Thank my you, life. Derek. No, I mean, same, I'm, same. It's, it's, my life is an adventure and that's why being at home during this pandemic sucks. It's awful. Yeah. You know, <laughs> yeah. Which, which leads to our first question, Brett, we've got a couple comments and questions for you and oh. I. So Tyler, my, my actually my co-producer, he's bringing yes. up a wonderful point. He says, pandemic aside, what do you think the future of conventions will look like in terms of fan demand? And you know, what do the fans want these days? Now, Tyler himself, just so you know, uh, he, and I don't want to embarrass him, but some people that know him know, know this anyway. He, he's a massive, massive, massive Star Trek fan. I actually met him originally at the Creation Convention Star Trek official event which is like, again, one of the massive ones, don't know how they're gonna go through it this year. But you know, in, in it, I'll answer Tyler's question first and then Brett, you can as well. My opinion of what do I think the future of conventions looks like is the first part of the question. I think for, for a very long time, probably even into 2022, we're all gonna be wearing masks still. I think that that's just gonna be a safety net that it's gonna be twofold, one, the convention will either require it or the city will require it. And second, we as human beings should be respecting each other and wearing it just out of sheer respect. And I also encourage people, please, I've been doing this from day one. A lot of people know I don't shake hands. I do fist bumps. And the reason is because I got stuck in a bathroom once in the UK protecting Billy D. Williams' stall. And for 10 minutes, I had to watch people use the urinals and not wash their hands. I... I was so turned off, I couldn't believe it. So please wash your hands more than ever now. And you know, so the future of conventions, you're gonna have uh, line control. The fire marshal might have new parameters that are put in place where only X number of people are allowed in the building. So maybe you know, half have to wait outside and we switch, who, who knows? And then the second part of the question, what do fans want these days? I can tell you the, the emails that I get consistently are the same that you just asked, Tyler, is what are the future of conventions? Fans want us to be back out there. They really want to be back out having these live experiences. And all of them have said, well, when we did the one in Vegas, Brett, back in October, we had signs posted, no mask, no service, and don't touch anything in our table. 
every fan followed suit. Nobody mm -hmm. touched anything. If they wanted to see something on the table, they asked if they could pick it up. We had a display copy of a book that anyone could touch because it was dirty. The rest of them we kept behind the table. So I think that's, you know, the fans want it so badly that they're going to follow any rule that's in place because they just want that interaction. Brett, what are your thoughts on it? Uh, pretty much exactly what you said, because this year, you know, fans are, fans are fans, you know, they want to be out there. They want to be going, they're missing cons as badly as you and I are, you know, who depend on it for a living. They're missing it because that's a major part of their life that they don't have. So I think they're going to be all ears like, okay, what do I need to do? I need to wear a mask. Got it. I need to do this. Got it. Carry hand sanitizer and use it every five minutes. Got it. I think they're going to be so open and so receptive. Um, and I don't, I'm knocking on wood. I really hope that uh, aside from an odd person here and there, I don't think we're going to see like someone flipping out. I don't want to wear a mask. I know my rights. Like we're not going to see that because they're all going to have that mentality of like, we want to be here. They don't want to come there to cause a, you know, if you don't want to wear a mask, just don't, don't come. Wait for, wait for your favorite celebrity to do a virtual signing. You know, do, do go that route if you cannot wear a mask. But, you know, by then, you know, a mask is not a new thing anymore. You know, like you said, it's been a, a year, you know, early on, it was like a suggestion. Now it's pretty much, man, now it's just like, why aren't you wearing a mask, dude? <laughs> like, so um, I think they're going to be so uh, ready to be back at a con that they're just going to be like, okay. Sure. Yeah. You need that. Okay. I'll do that. I, I that's, that's my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. So Brett, here's a question again from my, one of my favorite viewers, Janice, and this is directly for you, Brett. Oh, she'd awesome. Like to, she'd like to know what is the ratio of staff to volunteers at Granite State Comic Con and how much do cons rely on local volunteer help? Oh, okay. Well, um, volunteers make our world go round. Uh, we have uh, an awesome uh, army of volunteers uh, who are lovingly, lovingly referred to as uh, the red shirts. All of our volunteers uh, have red shirts on. It says red shirt. It's a Star Trek font. Obviously, it's a play on, <laughs> you know what happens to a red shirt, but it's more of they're down to do whatever is needed to get done. Um, we haven't lost one yet. Um, so it's... Uh, they make the world go round for us and you know we depend on them for many many things and we've been going on for so long that we've we've kind of gotten this amazing core and then we'll get like new recruits and then the old new ones train the new new one and it just becomes this symbiotic type of relationship you know um and i wouldn't trade them for the world it's just been just to sit back and like watch them at work controlling lines or you know doing this and all this stuff and it's just like they don't know i'm you know i'm like undercover boss style i'm like you know okay what are they and it's like it's just phenomenal it, it really is such a such an awesome thing and it's like yep they're you know they're giving up their weekend you know to uh do a lot of stuff and not all, not all of it is you know glamorous Absolutely. The volunteers are great. I know when I go to a convention, if there's a volunteer that I really like, I always ask the promoter to let them work with us again the following year. Yeah. Because it's hard to yeah. find the good volunteers that will, because I'm picky. I mean, Brett knows I'm a pain in the ass and I'm very, that can be very mean. You're picky. Let's say picky. I'm not going to say pain. Uh, in the ass. That's okay. I know, I know I'm a pain, but anyway, so let's see Todd Caston. Oh, hi Todd. Thank you for watching. Todd says fingers crossed for something to happen uh, later this year, but as Derek said, all the big ones will have to move to 2022 uh, to get the capacities that they need to make the shows happen. And that is true. That's that's why I was mentioning a lot of the big ones like Reed Pop that owns, you know, Emerald City, New York Comic Con. You know, they just they want to have shows. And and we, Brett, I'm sure you and Jeff have had the same thing. We've had amendments to our contracts <laughs> twice now for their shows, and they keep. Until they finally just went, you know what, we're just going to wait till 2022. And I'm like, yeah. oh. But yeah, it's the big ones, you know, like when, when Mr. Dorman was talking about San Diego Comic-Con, I've heard rumors, and I don't know any of this being at all true. I just literally, I 
hear rumors on the internet. You know, San Diego Comic-Con went virtual last year, first time in their history. And I've heard rumors that they're consider, considering doing it again because they, you know, San Diego Comic-Con is the largest in the world. 125,000 people a day go through the halls. Like, even if, even if everyone had a vaccine, by the time July comes around, I, first of all, I don't think by the time July comes around, we're all gonna be vaccinated, but I don't think that we're gonna have a comfort level, even if people had their vaccines, of being around that many people. So I think that's some of what the conventions are gonna be battling is that maybe they wanna be back, but they're gonna find that their ticket sales are slower because there's gonna be some people who are like, you know what, I'm not leaving home until literally everyone on the planet has had this or there's a cure, not a vaccine. So, uh, yep. right? what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think these, these you know, mega, no, not, I don't want to say mega con, because that's a specific con, but these large scale 100,000 plus, you know, 80,000, you know, it's, they require that many people to make their wheels go round. So, because then they get that caliber of guest and they can do these things, but they can't, San Diego can't be like, okay, we're going to have an actual, you know, an actual in-house event, not in-house, but we'll have a, you know, a real event, uh, but we're only letting in 25% of our normal. A, that would still be a ton of people, but B, it would not be anywhere near enough to keep their lights on. Yeah. So it's, it's this weird catch-22 of they can't. It, and it, somebody said, I don't know who, so I'm going to give, I'm not giving credit to somebody. Okay. A while ago, this is long before... I'm going to be so embarrassed if it was you. I'm going to be so embarrassed if it was you that said it. But um, somebody said that these super high level cons will not be able to sustain themselves eventually because they're going to collapse under their own weight. Because who are they? They're going to have to just keep upping the ante and getting yeah. more people. And it's like, oh, now we have Robert Downey Jr. is going to be there. It's like, yeah. but the mid-level, like the mom and pop, you know, our show, Dave, you know, Family Expo, we're going to be in a good spot because we can continue, but these super shows, they're just going to. It, it was me, Brett. We talked about it at one of the, it was me. And it's because. Sorry. I, no, no, it's yeah. fine because yeah. it's, but it's good to be out there. But you know, you got to remember, I've been doing this for 25 years and I've watched the industry change. And when they start getting these mega guests like Chris Evans or Chris Hemsworth that are, you know, exuberant amounts of a guarantee and their autographs are so expensive you know the fans will still pay for it but they, they okay. are going to they are going to collapse on themselves because eventually they're going to get to a point where they're either going to run out of the guests that are willing to come because you got to remember not every celebrity is interested in doing conventions you know they're not, you know you mentioned robert downey jr from from the insider things that i've known from people that know him he doesn't have any interest in them and it's not about the money. You know, they could offer him all right. the money in the world and he's just like, I don't have interest in that. It's, it's either, you know, it could be for a number of reasons. Maybe he, he doesn't like crowds or maybe he doesn't want to be a sellout or maybe he just doesn't want to travel when he's not doing a movie. He wants to be at home. You know, I met the man ages ago when I first moved to Hollywood. He is so humble and so down to earth and so- That's rich. what I hear, yeah. Yeah, that I can't imagine. So, you know, eventually you're going to run out of people and, you know, that's my opinion. I mean, let's hope it doesn't because then that means my job will change. But yeah, who knows? Who knows? I guess you just hope for a new crop of megastars yeah. to pop up, exactly. whoever is going to be the next, you know. Exactly. But. Exactly. Well, you know what? That is going to bring us to the end of our first show for season two. And Brett, I'm so glad that you were one of my guests today. So thank you so it's much. such an honor. Thank Do you. A, pitch, what an honor. Pitch your con one more time. All right. Greatest Day Comic Con, September 18th and 19th. This is, it's going on. Granicon.com. Uh, we are in the lovely, and there's no sarcasm, no sarcasm there. We're in the lovely Manchester, New Hampshire. If you have just thought, oh, I've never been to New Hampshire, give it a shot. Our time of year, it's not horrifically cold at all yet. In fact, sometimes it's still a little bit summery then, but you're also going to get a little taste of the leaves turning as well. Uh, and there's no sales tax. Come and shop. Oh, Derek, back up the food. How good yes. is our... Oh, my God. We, every night, we go to a different restaurant. We have yep. three favorite restaurants on the Strip. One is an yep. Italian, one is an Indian, and one is uh, Mexican. Uh, if you're at Granite State Comic Con in September and you see me, 
come and see me and I will tell you which That's restaurant awesome. to. The Italian one, they probably miss us because we know the owners now. We've gotten, you know, we always book a private oh, table and yep. everything. They're great. So but good. yeah, the food is um, amazing. Yeah, and it's all within walking distance. You yeah. stay at the hotel, there's a brand new hotel that just opened up as well that is already talking deals for our 2021 show. So that's awesome. But it's, it's on a street that's all amazing food and shopping walking distance. Yep. And again, gorgeous weather in that time of year. All right. Well, Brett, all the powers in the universe. I hope that I am seeing you at least in September, if not before on the road. Again, thank yes. you, my friend. Thank uh, you. We'll see you later. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. So guys, that brings us to the end of another in-house con. Again, first episode of season two. We have some great shows coming up next weekend. We are going to be, uh, yeah, it is next weekend. We are going to be hosting our first of a series called The Ladies of Star Trek. And next week we are going to welcome Janet Kidder and Rachel uh, Ann Shirelli. They are from both Star Trek Discovery. We also have coming up Comic Books Rock, which features comic book legend Mike Grell, as well as J.K. Woodward, and some other artists who you can actually order sketches from ahead of time. They're all on our website. And then in April, we're going to be doing Bringing Creatures to Life. We haven't announced it yet on the site, but it's coming. And I'm in, in talks with a bunch of other clients, as well as some non-clients this season that are going to come on and join us all through April, May, June, and then hopefully by the time June comes, we won't need these anymore. But I'm going to do my best to keep bringing these online events to you guys as long as we can't see you face to face. And I really appreciate everyone who watches. So thank you. My tech guy, Tyler, my co-producer, Tyler, is going to throw up into the chat room. If you want to be part of the Dave Dorman collection, you can purchase the first three pieces right now, today. The, the Indiana Jones over here, Jabba the Hutt are still available. The Jabba is almost sold out unless it's sold out while we were talking today on the, on the, uh, on the show. And the Newt one is for pre-order. You can pre-order it right now. The other ones will not be available for pre-order until we announce what character and franchise that it's from. But we will bring that to you as Mr. Dorman gets the artwork in all throughout 2020. Again, those are strictly limited to 25 pieces. Also, I want to let everyone know we are doing birthday greeting cards and birthday video greetings from select talent in our client roster. You can order birthday cards that will be signed by the celebrity to you. And you can also order uh, video greetings from them, which will be provided to you via a private link on YouTube where the celebrity speaks directly to you, uses your name, and wishes you a very happy birthday. All of those are available in the store as well. We invite you to check it out. We've got some celebrities that haven't been announced for that yet, but there will be more celebrities added to that entire greeting card uh, thing. I don't know what to call it, promotion or whatever. But anyway, that we've got some celebrities lined up now that you can buy and there'll be more later. I want to once again thank the people at Trek Report, Alien v. Predator Galaxy, Alien Theory, Star Wars Autograph News, Be More Super Podcast, and Nerd Alert News, and Comic-Con Network for supporting us, for promoting us. And again, to all of you out there, the fans, Thank you for supporting small business. Thank you for supporting me and my clients. And please stay safe from the pandemic. And I hope to see you all on the road real soon. I've got a short amount of credits for everyone to watch. It's not long like a movie. I invite you to watch them. Thank you so much. See you next week. Cheers.